Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to episode 320, 100 episodes away from a very funny episode. What's that, two years, almost? Because as, as I said before, I'm not going to miss a single episode of this year, and you know what, we're going strong. Oh, to be honest, you're lucky that I'm even here, because I narrowly avoided a manslaughter charge this morning, <laughs> and I'm being so for real. Uh, I, I almost very nearly accidentally killed a 70-year-old woman this morning. This is true. This happened about two hours ago. I'm still, like, fucking shaking about it. <laughs> but it's funny, and everyone's fine. <laughs> I, I go to the, this cafe every, every day, mm -hmm. and I go in through the back, right? They've got outdoor seating, and it's big fence, so you can't see through, right? And I take my dog, and I go in, and I open up the back door, and my dog goes in first, and I follow. And then she latched onto an old woman and ripped her face up. No, that <laughs> didn't happen. What happened was we go in, and, and uh, the only other two people in this little courtyard is this beautiful, sweet, 70-year-old couple. They're even older, like gray hair, hunched, frail, right? And I go in, and they've got this fucking stupid little fluffy dog oh. that's not trained at all. Oh. Right? I have a really big dog, 42 kilos, looks like a pit bull. We wanted a staffy, we got scared, okay? She's like a, a mix of an American staffy and a Great Dane. She's a big girl. She's a lovely, sweet, beautiful girl who doesn't even know that she could bite anything. That's what I want to say right after there their dog mauls a two-year-old in the UK. No, don't, don't, don't ban killer. Um, but anyway, in this case, it's actually true, right? And this stupid fucking other dog, we open, my dog goes in, and this stupid fluffy dog, like, turns around and just goes, ar, 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 and, like, runs at my dog. And it was on a lead, the other dog, but that lead was hooked around the bottom of this 70 year old woman's chair. And bro, the dog lunges at my dog, hits the end of the lead, gets yanked back, and then just, this woman's chair just ever so slightly goes off balance. And dude, I, have you ever seen a 70 year old woman fall over in slow motion? Bro, it was terrifying. Because what happens is, and she's on a ledge as well, so her little chair and the two back legs of the chair are on the very tip of like a ledge, only a few inches tall, but still a ledge. And the dog yanks it and the two chair legs go over the edge. And then the woman just goes, <laughs> and leans back. And for a minute, she's teetering. And I go, and, and then she starts to tip all the way back. And there was actually, there was another young couple in the cafe and they look at this woman and I look at this woman and her legs are there in the air and she's doing these ones like teetering you know when a high school kid is leaning on their chair they fall backwards crack their head and their brain falls out their ears she's doing those ones like teetering and, and slowly falling over her husband goes to save her again in slow motion he's 70 so by the time she starts tipping in her head you have the back of her head's almost at the concrete he's just put his hands on his knees to stand up and I see this and I go, and I, for real, I could have helped her. I could have run in and caught her. I go to do that and then a fucking stupid dog starts attacking mine. And my dog, right, has never, ever bit anything. But if she were, she would kill that dog. So I go to run to catch this woman. I could have, but then the dog attacks my dog. I'm like, oh, for fuck's sake. So I separate them and then I just have to watch oh, no. as this 70 year old woman slowly teeters back. If I had my time again I just want to let the dogs fight it out because mine was in a muzzle the other dog couldn't hurt mine but I just fucking panicked because I didn't want my dog to get put down because mm. that's what would happen they look at the scary dog and go yeah look yours killed it. Anyway then this woman just slowly teeters and she fucking falls on the grass and I was like, oh my, she hits the ground. I'm like, oh my God, she's dead. <laughs> and then she just very slowly gets up. These other people run over and help pick her up. And, and, and uh, I just grabbed this stupid little dog and I gave it back to the old guy. And I just went, I didn't even say sorry. And I was like, and he goes, that was not your fault. <laughs> I went, thank God. Yeah.
Uh, is so, she okay? She's totally fine. Okay. They finished breakfast. <laughs> they were eating beforehand and then they, they stayed there and they finished breakfast, but fuck, man. I think the only reason that she was fine was because she fell very slowly, so she kind of had time to lean forward, so she fell on her back and not her head. Mm. You know, if the dog was stronger, she would have... That's how old people die. A simple fall that a, that a, that you might maybe scrape your elbow <laughs> kills an old woman. Mm. But she's fine. And so is the stupid dog. But fuck, man. That's... You know, there are so many dogs that just should not be in public ever. Mm. Mine's really good because I take her everywhere. I expose her to this stuff. A lot of people take their dog out once a month and it's fucking overwhelmed. That it's like, the only solution to my overwhelm is to bite the nearest kid. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, like, uh, even just dogs that you see tied up and they're just screaming... And it's like, that dog, you shouldn't have them out there doing that. That's torture for them. Mine used to do that. Bobby used to do that when she was younger. I mean, it is easier, though, when they're younger. Like, if you get a rescue that's five years old, that's kind of the dog you've got. You know, you could teach it to sit <laughs> under controlled conditions, but it is difficult when you do have, like, a, a rescue dog that's a little bit older. But with mine, I would tie her out the front, and she would cry she has she used to have quite bad separation anxiety but we trained her out of it the way i did it was i would tie her up outside uh like uh a cafe uh or actually i, I used to i tried tying her out and then she would cry and bark and yip and choke herself so i stopped doing that and instead i tried to teach her that i'll always come back if she's quiet so i would tie her up on like a bike stand and just walk away from her and I would get five feet away, she would be screaming and crying, uh, and then I would just ignore it, and I would have looked fucking insane, because I do it in public. And, I, like, I'm not going to a store, I'm just walking down the street away from her, she's going, ah, like, it just looks like I'm abandoning a dog I don't want. Um, and in many ways, my life would be considerably cheaper if I did. Um, but what I would do is she would bark and bark and bark, and I would only turn around when she was quiet, so she'd be freaking out and I wouldn't even look at her and then she would stop because she's a little bit tired and then I would turn around and start walking back towards her and then she would go crazy and start barking and then I would walk away. And this took like 40 minutes the first time and everyone's watching me and, and everyone's like annoyed at the noise and shit. But you have to do it. And then eventually she worked out after like three days in a row of me doing that and only walking towards her when she was quiet. She worked out that you know, I will only come back if she shuts up and if she's quiet. And, uh, and that was when I was in sight of her. Then the next thing was like, I'm going to go around the corner where she can't see me. And then it started again. She would start freaking out and I would only come back when she was quiet. And now I can leave her like for 15 minutes or 20 minutes while I'm in a store doing something and she'll just chill and relax. And it's like, exposure like people think socializing a dog means getting dog to meet other dogs socializing a dog is actually just getting her getting your dog to meet the world all the time and like that's something that i was really careful to do when we got her was like i want to i want an adventure dog like I, i'm going to go all around the country and the world i would like a dog that i can take with me and that isn't going to freak out and have a horrible life so i need to expose her to everything she dreaming, her legs are shit. <laughs> you know, and now, and now, like, she, yeah, she can sit here and just relax while I yell at the wall. Doesn't matter what's happening. Although, the projector scares the fuck out of her. Yeah, she projector. hates the projector. We just got one for downstairs, because we didn't, I, we used to have the, we have one TV in the house, and we used to have it downstairs, but then I, I got, I just had this thing where I don't want any screens and blue light downstairs at all. Yeah. Um, but sometimes we do want to watch a movie in bed, so we got we settled on a projector, which is also way cheaper than the TV. So we have like a pull down uh, projector screen, and then like a cheap projector, and then we connected it to like a Bluetooth speaker that we just had laying around, and it's fucking awesome. It's way better than a TV, and it folds up and goes away, and it doesn't look like an ugly TV. Because you know when the TV's in the bedroom, you're just compelled to just fucking chuck it on whenever. But if it's just, even if it's just like a step, like a process to turn it on, like press the button to pull the projector screen down and then turn the projector and the speaker on, it's like, I can't be fucked doing that unless I really want to watch something. 
So it keeps me from just going to bed and going, I'm going to watch 10 episodes of Walking Dead and have an aneurysm. <laughs> you know, now I'm like, I'll watch one and then I'll turn it off yeah. some nights if I don't feel like reading. Um, but she fucking hates it. Because she has laser pointer syndrome, which which uh, was just from uh, my son using the laser pointer around it. He didn't know, it's not his fault. But he used the laser pointer around it and for the cats. And But she saw it and now she thinks that lights and shadows are sentient beings. <laughs> and she's always, oh, you see her, she's always looking at the roof and <laughs> looking around for things. And uh, do you know what the projector is? It's just lights and shadows because it's shooting light beams onto the wall. She fucking hates it. So when I go, hey, Bobby, we try to tell her that something's about to happen. Like when, uh, when we're about to turn a light on, if we turn it on when it's dark and it turns on, she'll freak out. But if we go, hey, Bobby, and then we turn it on, she knows that something's going to happen. But now when I'm downstairs and I go, hey, Bobby, she just starts looking around <laughs> going, but what? I know something's going to happen because everything downstairs is remotes. You know, like the light uh, is like we use the wireless light remote, so we turn it on, it changes color or whatever, and uh, she fucking hates it. But then the projector screen came into into the bedroom, and we go, "Hey, Bobby!" And then I hit the projector, and it starts going, and she just starts vibrating and having a panic attack because she knows that the only thing scarier than the projector screen is the projector itself turning on, putting zombies into the fucking bedroom. <laughs> So now I go, hey, Bobby, and she immediately just runs under the covers so she doesn't have to look at it. It's very cute, but she has a mental illness. It's frustrating. <laughs> so don't use laser pointers with your dog. You'll break something in their brain, and it's irreversible. <laughs> um, anyway, so I almost killed a 70-year-old woman, but uh, what I really wanted to talk about is uh, this, uh, this news coming out in Australia of all of these Australian music festivals mm. are just getting cancelled. Um, again and again and again, they're announcing them, they're putting tickets on sale, and then they have to cancel them. Um, and this happened to a fest. This is at Ugo festivals quite a bit, mm. uh, and it's happened to a bunch of festivals that you bought tickets to or were going to buy it to get to. Yeah, there's one down in down not far from here that was supposed to be this weekend, and they cancelled it last week because their main reason was people not buying tickets until the very last minute, which is actually. I wasn't going to buy tickets till the day of. Yeah, and I, as an event, person who puts on events and sells tickets, I've noticed this big time, is that uh, with my last tour that I did a couple of years ago, I sold, like, uh, I think a little bit more tickets than my previous tour, but I sold them way later. Yeah. So I, had, I was freaking out. I was like, oh, my God, I'm selling so terribly. For the, the three months before the event, I was like, this is fucked. I'm going to have to cancel shows. I've, I've lost it. I'm, this is crazy. And then about three weeks before the events happen in every single city, they just rocketed it up and people bought them. And I was like, oh my God, I'm fine. But the fucking anxiety of it yeah. was crazy. And now that's happening a little bit with this tour. It's not as bad because the venues are kind of smaller and I feel like people are more excited to see me because they know that I'm back and stuff and my videos have been going really well. So it's like, but it's definitely still kind of there of like, like for example, these Perth shows that are happening right now, if you listen to this, they're on sale now. A couple weeks ago, the first couple shows, I was like, fuck, am I doing too many shows? Maybe these aren't going to go very well. Today, which is, I'm recording this on Monday, the shows are Friday and Saturday, the first ones, they're great. They're going to fill out. Mm. But a couple weeks ago, I was like, oh no, I think I've, if I'm flying too close to the sun here. But people just book really late now. And I think it's like, I read a news article about it. All of these music festivals are having the same problem. Some of the biggest names, like the biggest festival names, don't exist anymore at all. And then a lot of them are, are like 10% of the size. What's the one that you went to? I went to one called Lost Paradise. And yeah. 2022 was 23,000 people. Yeah, 2023 it was 6,000 people. Yeah, that's crazy. And so these festivals were saying that they keep having to cancel because of the inflation, like everything's going on, petrol prices, insurance, the cost to transport music gear, the amount that musicians are charging, uh, advertising costs, like just fucking everything is so much more expensive. I even noticed this, like I'm going to Perth, 
my tickets were more expensive for the plane that they, than they normally are. Mm. And I got really lucky with a good deal on a hotel, but every, I checked it a few nights in a row and all my hotel costs were like way more than I was thinking they were gonna be that are what I was used to. Um, and then I gotta buy food when I'm there as well. Yeah. So it's like the costs are, are way up. And then the amount of money that you're able to play with before the events happen is so much lower mm. because people aren't booking until like the week beforehand. And I found like this is true, like as a consumer for sure, like I went to a live music thing the other day, but we didn't buy tickets till the fucking day off. Mm. Um, and you know what it is? Cause they, they interviewed um, festivals and the festivals came up with like, they interviewed the festival union and they came up with a really interesting point. Music festivals, especially they're targeting 18 to 22 year olds, like really young people who are kind of their first mu music experience. A lot of them is a festival that they go to with their friends. Like I remember my first live event as an, as an adult was like cursor by myself. And then after that, I went to, I think I went to big day out or something to see red hot chili peppers with my girl and a bunch of her friends. That was like five people. That was like 30,000 people. Some eyes. Yeah. So you're targeting those 18 to 22 year olds. And they said, the festival union said, these people have never been to a live event before because of COVID. Mm. Like their formative finding out what they like to do in their spare time from 15 to 21 in Australia, well, from 15 to 19, that was taken away, especially in Melbourne from, by, by COVID pretty much. Like a lot of these people, it was, it was two years, but like I'm saying like people age 15 to 19, that period where you work out, I like rap music, I like rock music, you know, I like going to these events. You didn't even have the opportunity to see what that was like. Mm. You weren't making any fucking money. And then, you know, all these people are like, I didn't have time to go to a fucking festival. I didn't even get to go to schoolies. I didn't even mm. get to start my career or I started my career, got put on hold for two years. Like all this shit happened to these kids that uh, were so young and now cost of living, people can't, people don't know if they can afford tickets until the week it happens. Mm. So it's like, I'm not gonna book tickets before when I booked that big day out event, like when I was 18, 19, I think we booked that six months before it happened. That was the thing, because they would sell out on the day. Yeah. Every music festival would sell out on the fucking day. Yeah, we, we booked our tickets back in fucking July, I think. Yeah. And so we had months to kind of prepare for how much we were going to spend. And we ended up spending, we didn't worry about costs while we were there. Like we, we bought dinner every night, we bought drinks every night. It didn't really matter to us, but I can understand why uh, some of the people we were with didn't have that luxury. <laughs> well, you're older, like for the festival crowd. Yeah. How old are you, 25 now? 23. 23. Um, we were the you're, like, you're on the older end. Yeah, getting that. Yeah. I also think that festivals have a really bad reputation. Like, well, they get cancelled all the time. Uh, it's the, yeah. uh, so, uh, so, they, so they were saying that, like, it's the cost of putting them on gets really high. Um, and also the people that we're targeting can't go to, uh, have never, uh, don't have that festival going culture like the people who are now 30 used to have. Mm. And when you're 30, you just can't go because you've got kids or you've got a career or whatever. You can maybe go to one every couple of years, like the average 30 year old person. Um, but, uh, and, and also the, they can't, so the festival said our costs have risen 40%, but we can't raise our ticket price 40% yeah. because then no one can afford to go. So we, the margins that we're playing with are just too fucked. We can't even put them on. But I also thought, I reckon the main reason, uh, and I, I would love to know what people listen to this think in the comments. I think that the main reason people don't book in advance is because people don't, this is leftover from, from COVID. Why the fuck would I buy a ticket to something that I don't even know if it's gonna happen? So if, I'm, if I really wanna to go to a music festival, I now know that it's definitely not gonna sell out until the couple days before maybe. Yeah, that's true. And I also know that it's highly likely it's gonna get canceled. So why would I take this $200 that I really need because I'm a young person who doesn't make that much money yet. Why would I take this $200 and give it to you when I could just keep it in my bank account 
just in case something goes wrong and then give it to you when I'm ready to go or when I know that it's not going to get cancelled because it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. These things get cancelled because no one books in advance, but no one books in advance because these things get cancelled. And I think especially the layover from COVID, so many people are still waiting on refunds for a lot of these bigger music festivals that, and they haven't even got their money yet. This was fucking years ago now. Yeah. And like, that's, that's like a, a, a huge thing. And I, even I'm noticing this, like people uh, who want to come to my Perth shows, they look at all my dates and they go, I'm definitely going. And they book the night before. And as an events organizer, that fucking sucks. It's so anxiety inducing, even just like, not even for the money, cause I've made my money back now. Like I've covered my flights and accommodation. So I'm like, sweet, every dollar that I make now goes into my pocket. Fuck yeah, the shows are gonna be fun. But even just from like a month out from the shows, I'm thinking, fuck, these are all gonna be a disaster because I've sold no tickets. Now I'm sweet, cause I'm a week out and they've all sold a lot of tickets. I'm like, fuck yeah, these shows are gonna be great. But the fucking headache of like, oh my God, it's horrible. So now, you know what I do? I don't look at ticket sales. I just promote the shows and I make my videos. And the day before I go, how many do we have in? Cool. It's funny you say that because five minutes before we started recording, we found out Eric Andre is coming next month. Yeah. And in my head, I was like, all oh, good. I'll buy tickets tonight before. Yeah. Because I'll just buy them on tickets or like a resale website. Yeah. If I can't get normal ones. Same yeah. with like Theo Vaughn. He's here in March. I'm not going to buy tickets till probably the day. Well, because you also, you need the money. Like people don't have fucking $300 to throw away like right now for an event that might happen in six months. Mm. People are just like hanging on to that money for if they get sick or if something comes up or if, you know, an, an event happening this week, you know, goes on sale or happens or they hear about or whatever. Um, but the problem with that is these music festivals, especially these multi-day ones, like as a person, you have to organize it six months in advance because you need, you might be going with fucking, I mean, the one you went to, you went with the five, five people. Yeah. So you have to organize that months out to make sure that everyone's free. But then if all of you go, yeah, let's do it. But then all of you wait until the week before to buy tickets. Turns out three of you can't make it. And then the other two go, ah, oh, well, fuck it. I won't go. Also with that, someone, if you want to all want to be together, someone has to kind of buy take the burden of buying the bulk tickets yes and no one has three grand to do that and then get paid back like when i was 18 everyone kind of had like 1500 bucks yeah or two people had 700 each two people go in they give it to one person he buys it and then the rest of you pay it back because you trust your friends that's a pretty normal thing but that there's no way i mean i don't have two grand to fucking you know buy four tickets for my friends or, or six tickets for my friends and then get paid back, you know, over the next few months. But like, you know, a couple of years ago, pre-COVID, for sure. Like I'd be the guy that's like, yeah, sweet. I'll buy them all now. You guys pay me back whatever you can. Yeah. We'll, we'll say, I, I do actually think that the reputation of festivals is quite bad. <clears throat> Not for the cancelling, just for the, the vibe. Mm. Like, our friend Tyler, he went to Big TV last year and he and I were talking about it and he's like, oh, it's the worst fucking festival. And I went to a festival last year called Langway and it's a day festival and day festivals just suck. I will say, yeah, even when I went, like when I was 18 to Red Hot Chili Peppers, me and my girlfriend had the fucking worst time. Yeah. And that's her favorite band. Yeah. And you know, you know what we did? Her, her favorite band, in our, it's probably maybe our only opportunity in our life to see Red Hot Chili Peppers live. And, and she just had a panic attack in the pit. And I had to try and convince her to leave, but she wouldn't because it was her favorite band. It was a fucking horrific time. And she had that because there were too many fucking people and it was hot and, it's and it wasn't managed properly. And... Yeah, yeah. I think camping festivals are the best. They're just expensive because you can relax and you can hang out with your friends and then you can go see the band you like. Yes. But yeah. the day festival so. uh, Although the one we went to, the, the one in Queensland for the Nobby thing. That was nice. That was fun because we were... VIP and we got well yeah we did that's <laughs> not that's not a real experience is it yeah. like everyone else seemed to be having quite a shit time <laughs> sitting on the grass in the sun no shade fucking anywhere no drinks close to you the drinks that were close to you were fucking $15 you know like 
us not having to line up for the toilets yeah makes just an unbelievable difference like we had a, a dedicated toilet for the vip i waited in line there were two people ahead of me and it was still gross yeah and foul in there whereas when i was out out there like uh mingling with the disgusting peasants their oh, fucking boy. toilet line was like 40 minutes long yeah. either of them and it was even more foul yeah i i think the takeaway is camping festivals are really fun yes and but they cost a lot of money and never yeah. go to a day festival no day festivals are because day festivals are so stressful as well because you have your list of bands that you want to you're gonna run around you yeah. want to sit down and relax a little bit and if you're with if you're with friends they'll be like oh i want to see this person at one o'clock on this stage yeah. how you don't give a fuck yeah about that it's like i don't want to see that and that sucks i was watching i only see the bands i'm gonna see yeah mm. i'm very selfish at first anyway but yeah i think it's it's a really interesting problem that i don't i don't see getting better for years personally because like it's really only like individual act events that have kind of started to come back in a big way like stuff like what i do like you go and see one person and you have a great time feel that people are going to start there and then they go all right i'll drop 500 dollars to see eight of the biggest bands in the world yeah maybe yes i think uh but it, it, i don't know it's just like you know industries come and go and and that's like all those big players are kind of um like fading away all those big festivals and shit like that and it's maybe maybe they're just being done wrong as well and the new generation needs to kind of take over festivals of music acts that's another thing like all these music festivals that get put on especially in australia I mean, the fuck are any of these people that are performing i don't i don't recognize any of them no uh and i'm not saying that as like a boomer it's like fuck a lot of these bands are really old you know and it's like you know you want to catch those gen z people it's like if, if i know a lot of the bands you know the problem is all these music festivals i know everyone performing that's bad <laughs> i should look at a music festival that has the lineup posted it's got ten thousand comments of people excited and i look at all the band names and i go oh who are all these people i don't know any of these these acts oh music used to be good if i look at a festival lineup and i think it's really good that's a problem because i'm 30 <laughs> and i'm not going I'm 30. <laughs> um, all right, little update on the swimming, okay? Uh, I made a big promise over on my vlog channel. I'm gonna be swimming 100 times this year and uh, we are in week three and I've gone swimming five times, I five? think. Four. Four. I've caught up today. Oh, I'm going swimming tonight. Tonight's number five. So uh, it's uh, it's all happening, and I'm actually uh, right now is recording right on schedule, soon to be ahead of schedule. No way, I'm currently behind because week three should have I should have six swims under the belt. But I'm making a big call here. When I go to Perth, I'm swimming every day. I reckon I'm going to do it. My hotel has a pool. I can't confirm how long it is it's not going to be 25 meters it's probably not going to be 25 meters you know why because the hotel was quite affordable uh so it's probably going to be one of those fucking splishy splashy pool the toddlers vomit into um but there is like just a normal indoor pool yeah that's like 15 minutes away so i'll be able to do that every day i don't believe you that just motivated just <laughs> so much <laughs> say that again you fucking bitch i don't believe yeah you'll see you'll see all right every you know what you're gonna see every morning when you wake up at like 5 a.m it's gonna be ping lewis just logged his swimming workout because for me that'll be like 8 p.m <laughs> you know, i'm in perth yeah you know what's so funny <laughs> the perth flight I, uh, I i'm looking forward to the shows and i'm looking forward to going to perth i'm not looking forward to getting there this is another thing, like, everyone's like, everyone's, whenever I announce a show in Perth, people from Perth are so grateful. Oh my God, are you coming to Perth? That's amazing. Firstly, I've been coming to Perth every single tour for my whole career, except for maybe the first one. I think even the first one I went to Perth. Secondly, the reason why no one goes to Perth, all right, you fucks, is because you guys are the worst when it comes to booking tickets, all right? Now, I don't stress about it as much. But every year, you guys are like, oh, I'm definitely going. I'll book two minutes before I arrive at the venue. <laughs> and uh, so I, can't, I can't tell, I can tell you, like, I reckon more than five times I've gotten on the plane to Perth, looked at my ticket sales and gone, this is going to be a fucking disaster, and then walked on stage, get sold out. Fuck you. Buy your tickets now. I'm over it. LewisFees.com, fucking book them. You give me anxiety. <laughs>
for real though, Friday and Saturday, uh, they're going to be full, which is really good. This is one of the few times where I'm not freaking out about Perth sales. <laughs> which is really cool because I was, I've was i never done the Perth Fringe Festival. I've only ever gone to Perth and I've done like one or two shows in a night and then left. Because it's such a fuck around. You gotta, the, the travel is four hours. So I would get up at like five in the morning. Uh, so here's my plan to get to Perth this time. I'm doing it so much better. Right. Previously, I would get up and I would fly to Perth. I would arrive there at like 4 p.m. and then do the show that night. And then I would get up early in the morning and leave uh, for Melbourne. And I would be in and out and I wouldn't see even a second of Perth. Right. This time I have like 10 shows, I think, um, or less because the Sundays got cancelled because the venue fucked everyone around. Uh, it's like nine shows got all their Sundays cancelled. And for me, I wasn't going to sell out every single show. So I'm like, all right, that's annoying because Sundays usually sell well, but those people will get moved to different events and they'll make every other night a little bit more packed. But fuck, man, if I was selling out every single night, I'd be like, fuck, <laughs> you're losing so much money. But anyway, now I'm flying up the day before. Mm. So I'll, I, it is fucked getting there. I'm waking up. Because I'm leaving from Frankston, right? I'm waking up at like fucking 4 a.m. or 3 a.m. And then I... What time did you fly? It's like in the morning. Right. Right, early in the morning. So I, I think I get on the plane at like 8.30. And then I fucking am flying for four and a half hours. And then I get off the plane at 9.30. <laughs> <laughs> And then I get to my hotel, and then I don't have a show that night. So I can kind of like explore, do whatever I want to do. And then uh, I have Mondays off, well, and Sundays, which is really annoying because I wanted to perform Sundays. But what's cool is I have Monday and Sunday off. I'm actually going to be able to explore Perth. I've never gone to the beach there once. Apparently, it's one of the most beautiful beaches in the world. Mm. Greeley called me and he goes, you have to go to this beach. It's the edge of the, of the fucking world. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, that beach in Perth, there's no country until like Africa or something, I think. Yeah. It's like you can go straight and you won't hit anything for until you're on the other side of the fucking globe, which is really cool. And it's apparently one of the best beaches in the world. But I'm going to actually be able to enjoy the city that I'm in. That's something that I want to do this tour because I'm going around solo. I'm not bringing anyone with me. Um, and maybe to Sydney and Brisbane, I'll bring you if you're free and I can afford it. Yeah, I'm free. I've already booked it out on my calendar. Oh, cool. But <laughs> yeah, this is Perth. I'm going to be there for like two weeks pretty much. And I'm just there by myself. I don't have to do anything. I think I'm going to actually try and enjoy the city because it's something that I've never really done when I'm on tour. Because I, I, when you're traveling with a team, you have to do it like that because it's you can't take three people for fucking 10 days and pay for their hotels and flights. It's crazy expensive. But when it's just you, you know, I can do that because I'm the hotel cost is the same. The flights is, you know, so much less because it's just me. I can afford to stay an extra day or two and just see the city and enjoy it. So I'm really looking forward to actually getting to experience the cities that I'm actually performing. in. I think the only place I've, I've ever gone to uh, and actually like experienced it is Sydney. Um, and Tassie because I live there but everywhere else is just like in and out Canberra I've been there for one day left and Brisbane I've been there for like two days because I had two shows left but this time I'm, when I'm touring and especially because I'm now like vlogging I'm going to try and actually experience it and enjoy it and mm. I think a lot of that is like you know I would do a show and then I'd be so sick I'd be like fuck I'm so tired and I just want to stay in my hotel room and sleep. Um, yeah, that happened in Adelaide. Do you, we last time we were in Adelaide together? Do I remember? We went out for breakfast. Yeah. And you're like, all right, uh, I'll, I'll sleep for a little while and then we'll go explore. And then at six o'clock, I knocked on your door. I was like, all right, ready to go? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was very ill, man, and I don't remember that at all because <laughs> I was asleep. You know, shit like that. Like, I want to. I want to, like, uh, you know, take the train in somewhere in Perth and fucking, or get in an Uber 20 minutes anywhere and just see the, I've, I've, for someone who has toured as extensively as I have, I only really know what, like, the very, very inner CBD of five states looks like. 
And then I've also been to uh, Bundaberg. That sucked. You know, that's one I can comfortably say, look, I don't really need to explore. I've seen it, they've got a pub and some domestic violence, that's about it. Um, so yeah, I'm excited for that, that's gonna be fun. Let me know your suggestions for what I should do in, in Perth or WA generally, because here's another thing I could do. I've got a Monday and a Sunday off. I could fucking travel out, stay somewhere else for a night, Monday night, come back, Sunday, and then I don't have a show until the next uh, Tuesday. I did that wrong. Sunday and then Monday and then Tuesday. But you know what I mean. Um, a lot of YouTubers are quitting. Heaps of them. It's really interesting. All these YouTubers have come out and they're, they're announcing that they're quitting or they're completely changing their content to something else. I've done the reverse. I've come back and I'm like, I'm going to be a fucking comedian and a YouTuber again. I've done the complete revert. Everyone else is quitting. I'm coming in going, let's go. <laughs> is this a bad sign? If I come into the end times, all the, all, the, all the other multi-millionaire successful YouTubers are like, all right, that's it. I'm getting off this sinking ship. I'm arriving, no life jacket going, let's fucking go. Let's drive straight to that iceberg. I want to see if I can touch it from the boat. <laughs> Huge creators are just uh, quitting. Huge legacy uh, creators. Is, uh, Tom Scott, is his name? Yeah. Tom Scott, he quit. He's been doing one video a week for like a decade. British science guy. British science guy, one of the OG incredible YouTubers. I love watching his stuff. He's quitting, uh, just citing burnout and he's done it all. Burnout and old. Yeah. Um, Same with Matt Pat. Yeah, Matt Pat. He's got four channels. Four, four YouTube channels. He's stepping aside, and he's gonna, he's gonna try. Can you explain to this channel? Because he's one of the people who's quitting that I actually don't know too much about. He has um, theory channels where like games. Oh uh, yeah. He'll talk about Minecraft, and is it possible to be Minecraft in two hours, whatever? Hmm. And then he's got film theory, which explains itself, and then food theory, which is just. What, like, how, how many mils of air is in a packet of chips is pretty much mm. this channel is. Yeah, yeah. About. And then fashion theory. Oh, wow. Which is just, from what I understand, it's like, how would they make the, the jeans that the Hulk wears? That's garbage. Uh, I would watch that. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so he's like a good example of, like, that's a proper business, production business, and he kind of is the voice or the face of like every channel. Yeah. But there's no way he's writing any of those scripts. I would I would say he probably writes one script or like co-writes and then and then just maybe punches up. up. Yeah. Makes them sound more like him. So that's like I think he said that he's gonna like slowly phase himself out and they're gonna keep uploading but it'll be someone else and he'll just run the business. He'll be creative director, I think is what he said. Yeah, and that's like, that's been tried before, and that works really well with legacy media, like TV, like The Daily Show, perfect example. One host for fucking 10 years, and then they swap him out, and then it keeps running like a well-oiled machine, and that works because what else are you going to watch at fucking 9pm weeknights? Yeah, uh, equals three. That's what I was going to bring up. Yeah. yeah, Ray William Johnson, he was really one of the first YouTubers to do a show that you know, ran like clockwork, was the same format that really worked, and he had enough, burned out. Well, it's not even really burnout. It's like, I feel like when you do something every day for fucking 10 years, you, you just kind of naturally go, all right, I want to try new things creatively, um, but this thing is really working, and really, anyone can do it. Like, if it's, there's not much of a difference between Jimmy Kimmel and Jimmy Fallon. You know, they're doing the same show. Mm. It's a format. You, as long as you find someone charismatic and, you know, upbeat and who can work hard, they can do it. But it just doesn't really work like that on YouTube. Um, it seems like Ray William Johnson stepped back and theoretically another guy can fill that spot and go, what's up, welcome to Equal Suite, check out this video. But people, on the internet, they grow attached to people, not formats. And formats are really good tools as a creator to help you be consistent, but they're not always the... They're rarely the reason why people watch. Mm. It's because of you and your personality. So it's very hard to kind of go, all right, I'm going to replace my personality with a completely different one. It's like... It, it, you know what? It's like, it, it's like if fucking... Uh, it's like if Taylor Swift retired 
and was like, all right, uh, the Taylor Swift albums work really well. They write these types of songs and these types of uh, melodies and we run our business like this. I'm just going to, I'm retiring. I'm just going to put a new girl in here and you all watch her and listen to her and buy tickets to her. People are going to be like, well, this music is really good that she's writing, but we, we like you. So... Mm -hmm. And even if Taylor wrote the songs, if someone else sung it, people would be like, yeah, we want you. Um, but everyone's freaking out and going, why are all these big YouTubers quitting? I think it's just really natural. I think this is what happens when someone does something every day for 15, 10 to 15 years, they make enough money to retire and then they have children and they're like, well, I don't, especially like Matt Pat, who's, who's, he, yeah, he might write one or two, one or two scripts a month, but everything that he's reading is written by other people, edited by other people, shot by other people. You would start to be like, well, how needed am I in this? Like, why am I here fucking 10 hours a day when I could be with my kid? You know, I have enough money in the bank for this to fail and I'll be sweet anyway. So swap me out, even if it drops fucking 70%. Revenue wise, it'll still work. Mm. Um, and it's just another reason why I feel like very, very lucky to be doing what I do in the sense that I don't think that I could ever possibly get sick of stand up because it's such an ever evolving art form that evolves with me. Like, whatever I care about, I will speak about and make funny. And that's the only criteria. Like, as long as I perform every night and I make it as funny as it, as it can be, it will work. It's not a strict format. Like, you know, 60-minute show, or if I'm having fun, it could be an hour and a half. You know, it's very, very not limiting at all. Um, but, and then I have this podcast, which, again, is the same thing. It's like, whatever I cared about this week, whatever I found funny this week, Sometimes they're, they're fucking hilarious episodes like the Jews in the Tunnel or Jeffrey Epstein. Sometimes they're a little bit more serious and, and about the business of being a creator because that's what I'm passionate about. So that's what I want to talk about this week. And you guys will listen to that and appreciate it because you're here for just for me. There's no format to this show. It goes for an hour, 40 minutes to an hour. That's the show, and it's like, oh, what does Lewis want to talk about this week? I could do this until I'm fucking 70. You know, I'll be sitting here with dementia going, uh, who are you? And you'll be like, I'm Keelan. <laughs> we do a podcast. What's a podcast? You remember Bill Burr? <laughs> oh, I love Bill Burr. Yeah, he does, he does a podcast. Oh! <laughs> you know, whereas... I guess a format like Bi-Monthly Bull, which I, I dearly, dearly love, but if that was the only thing I did every day, I could do that probably, yeah, for five to ten years, and I'd fucking nail it, and I would love it. But after ten years, I'd be like, fuck, I, I can't do this anymore. It's, cr it's crazy, like, the amount of work that goes into it and how repetitive it is, and, like, that's something that's awesome to watch because it's comfortable, it's familiar, but to do it every day on a loop is so draining. And I think, yeah, people retire. That's super normal. Mm. Or, or not even retire, they just switch fields. Like, that's super common for anyone you know that has had a job in a field for 10 years. Sometimes that entire field dies and they adapt, or sometimes they go, oh, actually, I want to try and start my own business and do something else. Or they make their money and they fucking retire. Um, and that's really interesting. I think that's really cool. A lot of people are sad about it because they lose their favorite creators, but I think it's so cool to see the the creator economy be matured enough for people to actually retire that's a great sign for the health of it you know people fucking retire and they spend time with their kids pewdiepie great example he's not retired but but like he's retired from the grind of the daily videos and and killing himself to to be there and every single day multiple times a day streaming this that you know he's made his money he's he's living in his dream location he's got a kid with his wife He's like, oh, I'll just do videos that I really care about and check in every now and then, and everyone's really stoked with that. I think that's cool. One thing that's interesting, though, is, is Meat Canyon, the um, animator YouTuber, one of my favorite channels, has just come out, and he's just uh, not quitting, but he's quitting the grind. I think that's what a, a, what a, there's like 
YouTubers that are retiring and then there's other YouTubers that have matured and have made their money that are quitting the grind and are being like, I'm no longer doing this for views and for money and for algorithms and for metrics and profit and loss and all this bullshit. I'm only going to do this for fun and for the love of it because I've made my money. I don't need money. Yeah. Um, Meat Canyon has come out and uh, after being one of the only animation channels that has managed to consistently be on time to trending things for over a year. You know what I mean? Like every other YouTube channel that did animation, Oni and it, it, uh, all these other YouTubers as well that, that I love, they all burn out because it's impossible to create animation regularly on a shoestring budget. And a shoestring budget for animation is like $20,000 a video. That's fuck all to create like a video, like five minutes of animation, that's no money. In a week, that's no time, it's impossible. Uh, and it seems like the, the, the grind and of that is fucking ridiculous. And that's, what, that's one thing to do it to yourself, it's another thing to do it to all your employees, mm -hmm. which is what these animation channels have to do. And uh, I feel like if I were running a really big successful animation channel and I had my employees constantly under an insane amount of like crunch time and pressure, I just feel like it would be a matter of time before some kind of lawsuit or Twitter thread or whatever that would come out and maybe legitimately so. I'm, not, I'm definitely not saying this about Mead Canyon. I don't think this is true. I don't think this this would come out about him, but like as a business owner, if I was making my employees pull like 10, 12 hour shifts, which you would have to do as an animation channel if you want to get shit up regularly, I would just be so fucking scared of, you know, burning my employees out of their chosen career or their dream and shit. So he's actually come out and said, we're going to release a video when I feel like it and when I'm proud of it. And that's it. Um, and now he's just moving over to like commentary and reaction video content, which I am actually loving. I'm watching and I really like it. It's fucking great. It's actually very inspiring to me because I've, I've been in a bit of a weird place with my YouTube channel. Like I'm not sure what I want it to be. Loving the podcast, loving the vlogs, loving doing real talks and loving uh, the idea of doing stand up clips once I film them again uh, in Perth. But like my main YouTube channel, you and me have been talking about a lot of like, fuck, what do we want it to be? You know, because it's, it's hard. It's it's such a grind to do long form content that's edited well. So I couldn't imagine what it would be like to do that while you're also running five channels or while you're also trying to do one animation video a week mm. that is supposed to do 20 million views or you lose tens of thousands of dollars of money that you spend on it. Like, fuck. I'm stressed about my YouTube channel and, and it costs me nothing to do and I edit the videos myself. <laughs> you know, fuck that. So, I don't know, I just think it's a, it's a really interesting uh, point in the creator economy that we're at where YouTube is retiring. I think it's a good thing. I think it's awesome to see people retire instead of fail and quit. Mm. It's like, I love I loved seeing that, you know, 10 years in the future, I could retire if I wanted to. I don't think I ever would. Definitely not stand up. I reckon I'm doing stand up until I'm 70 year old, 70 years old, and really out of touch. And half my audience can't hear me because they're all deaf. That's what I'm doing. Um, like that woman at the cafe when she tipped over in her chair. That's how I dine, and it happens on stage. I see a stool, my glasses aren't on properly, and I sit on the wrong area and break my hip and get a concussion and die. That's how I go out, and 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 I love that. Um, you see that video, Kelsey Grammer falling off stage. No, <laughs> okay. pull it up. That's all in the video, the the episode. I want to see Kelsey Grammer falling off stage. See, that's how I want to go, man. I want to, I want to die. You know, like I saw these these videos of um, who, I think who was it? I think it was the Guns N' Roses singer. They were posting video of him on TikTok clowning on him because he can't sing as well. The the guy's a senior citizen, mm. and they're comparing his voice now to how it was when he was like 23 and on coke. And it's like, I actually watched both clips and he's not as good at singing as when he's old, but I like the older one because I'm like, fuck, how cool to watch a 70 year old guy still do his thing or however old he is. Kelsey Grammer's Frasier falls off stage. 
I love that he's definitely not Frasier either. They wore. <laughs> they just put that in there anyway. Like he's doing Frasier and falls off the stage. Sure, I'm sure it's just wild there, though, for any guy with a U.S. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he does the Peter Griffin! <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's a big drop. Fuck, wow, he would have <laughs> smashed his knee. <laughs> I was a UN interpreter. <laughs> <laughs> Why do 40 people come over to help him? That's so funny. Oh, man. You know, I've only ever fallen off stage once. You weren't working with me at this point, I don't think. I think this was the Try and Stop Me tour. I remember. Oh, this was... Yeah, North Borders was the one filming. So yeah, it was yeah, it was the Try and Stop Me tour. I fell off stage once, and it was when, if you see my comedy special, Death Rest Don't Scare Me, available on my website, lizbiz.com, it was the bit where I was doing the amputee lesbians, mm. right? So I'm talking about these lesbians that have no arms. I've got my hands in my t-shirt. So it's like a really bad fall, because I couldn't call, and my hands are inside my t-shirt like this, and it was a, a small venue, I think in Ballarat or Geelong, so it was like a temporary stage they'd set up. Oh, no. And I put my foot like down and the gap is maybe like a foot wide. And I just put my foot down into this gap and I thought it was stage. And I just fall down like onto my fucking face. Because <laughs> oh. <laughs> my hands are inside my t-shirt. I fall on my face and uh, miraculously didn't break my ankle. We ended up going to watch the footage back. I think it's actually online somewhere. Well, I must, I should have, I surely would have posted it. But if you watch the footage back, my foot goes down to this cabin. And then as I fall, I pull it up and out of the hole. If I didn't, I would have like snapped my ankle so bad because it would have gotten stuck and then I would have fallen sideways and it would have gone crack. And that would have been my whole fucking tour done. <laughs> so luckily that didn't happen. Uh, and won't happen on my tour, loosefears.com, grab your yeah. tickets now. I'm performing in Perth right now as you're listening to this. I have shows uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and I used to have one on Sunday, but hey, it got cancelled. And that's why people don't fucking book tickets, because venues fuck me around, and then a bunch of people who bought tickets on Sunday had to choose a new day, alright? So grab your tickets now, loosebeers.com. None of the other shows will get cancelled. I really want to see you there. Uh, Perth is selling really quick, uh, especially if you want those Friday, Saturday shows. Uh, if you want a Sunday show, fuck you, the venue, fuck me. Um, and then I'm in Melbourne, then I'm in uh, Adelaide, then I'm in Sydney, and uh, a bunch of other dates will be announced uh, as soon as possible. We are organising them. If you're thinking I'm coming to Sydney, the answer is yes, unless you live in Yemen. Uh, but some other people are visiting you very soon. Um, <laughs> all right, guys, we'll talk to you next Sunday. I hope you have a shit one. Bye. And I just need to record a ticket plug for the start of the episode. Hey, I forgot. Hey. hey, I'm in Perth right now performing my shows. I've got a show on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and that's it. So grab your tickets at loosebeers.com, Perth. Come and see me live. I really want to see you there. I'm in your city right now performing. Book your tickets now. Then I've got shows in Melbourne in March and April. Loosebeers.com. After that, Sydney is on sale and Adelaide's on sale. More dates coming soon. Let's get into the show. Grab your tickets. Loosebeers.com.